Hey, this is Rob Swanson with the Real Estate Mogul Show. Let's get into it. What's up, everybody? Rob Swanson back here with another episode of the Real Estate Mogul Show. We've got the crew back in the office, and we've got some really great news this week. We did not have to pay Mike to hang out with him, and Henry and I both <laughs> got to hang out with him. Hey, hey. It was incredible. <laughs> it was like, I don't know, a, a birthday gift, a Christmas <laughs> gift, a Thanksgiving gift, an Easter gift, an anniversary gift, all wrapped. A dream well, come it true. Might be, <laughs> it, it was a dream come true. It might be uh, a little over-exaggeration, but I don't know. Uh, Joe over there on the buttons. Did you throw this up on the screen? Yeah, let's look at this. Joe Please. on the buttons. We, uh, yeah, we got out onto the creek uh, just uh, west of Boulder, Colorado, and we did a little fly fishing after work one night. It yes. was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was, it was fun. We did less fly catching than we did fishing. A lot of hiking. We did. A, yeah, we did a lot of fair hiking. amount of hiking. Yeah. That was uh, news to you, right, Mike? You didn't know it was going to be a hike, and you just thought it was going to be fishing. It was fun. So here, we leading up to this, <laughs> Henry tells us, hey, guys, you're going to love the spot that I found. Uh, it's it's five-minute hike from the car. <laughs> 42 minutes later, <laughs> we're like, hey, I think we can hear the river. <laughs> I think we can hear the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. my gosh. It makes, me, it makes me wonder how accurate his portfolio cash flow is because his math seems a little suspect i'm, I'm making 2500 bucks a door i'm pretty yeah. sure yeah. it's so good i'm making so much money in real estate yes i can All prove right, the numbers for the for the rentals yeah you I, can. I guess it's i could have just you guys could have googled the trailer or whatever uh, the, hike, hey, we got the hike was great yeah it was by a good way. hike it, it was, was good just fun um, it was uh, it was warm by the time we got down there uh, with the waders on, but then getting back up, it was nice. It was fine. It was fun. All right, guys. Uh, you guys also uh, you guys also saw a few. Uh, it was Snake Week this yeah. week. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so oh, th that's right. On the way back, on the way back out. Yep. So we're gonna get we're gonna get into scripts. The real estate topic today is going to be scripts, but we're going to do a little intro conversation here. So, guys, check this out. If you're watching the video, not just listening to the podcast, this was not scripted on the hike out. This was not scripted on the on the hike out, but we're walking along, and I think it. Who was it that jumped? Mike? He it was stepped me. on it. Thank Mike you. Mike almost stepped on him. So right. I, I turned back and I got this little video of this big old long bull snake. Check this out, guys. If you're watching the video, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you should go check it out because this dude was no. No joke. He's pretty now, good size. He's he's a good size. Pretty good he's size. Just a, he's huge. just a bull snake though. Like he's not. He can't no. hurt anything. Yeah, he didn't rattle he's, at us. No, he's not a rattler. He's not a rattlesnake. But um, sometimes when you see it out of the corner of your eye, you're not really sure at first glance, right. rattlesnake or bull snake. Right. You you oftentimes hope it's a bull snake. The the only difference is bull snakes will usually be like this kind of stretched out, whereas a rattler will be coiled. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see the long the length, it's usually a bull snake. The problem here is when you're walking, and then you almost step on it, you don't have time to no, evaluate. You don't. No, you don't. <laughs> what is that? No, because when a when it's a rattler is moving, yeah, when a rattler is moving across the trail, he's stretched out. So you right. don't you don't always know. Yeah. You yeah. don't know. All right. Let's. Uh, and and I think. Joe, you did a little snake action too. Yeah. So why don't you uh, bring us to an update? So this was this was up uh, down in southern Colorado in Sawatch. There's some retreat land that we have down there, and um, so a buddy of mine and a buddy of mine and I were down there enjoying the weekend. And he, this is what we came across in the in the shower at about 1:30 in the morning. This is not acceptable in a shower. No, thank you. It was it, it's super exhilarating. Now we had there's a barn out there. And sure, we that's had the right word. We had a snake tool. Is um, this also a, no, here, a bull snake? Throw that up there again, Rob. Hit the hit the thing. Um, that was a nice little video of the of the scene there. Uh, beautiful. Try so th yeah, there, there we go. go. So there's the there's the snake. It was a bull snake. Yeah. We didn't really know exactly. I'm not familiar with it, and he's it more goes familiar. <laughs> It's a rattlesnake. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Not, that's not a rattlesnake. That th another harmless little creature. Right. Yeah. Not another, in your shower, though. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Another harmless yeah. little creature from God's creation. Nothing wrong with that at right. all. Right. No, now, thank if you. If it was a spider, destroy it. <laughs> oh. Well, we got him safely out of the shower and had a had a nice time. And then this Man, was. This the, is why you live in Colorado. It's yeah. So this beautiful. is the next day. Just looking out at the Sangre de Cristo mm. Mountains. 
Yep. That's just awesome. beautiful. And you could see that shadow that was creeping up over there is coming from that mountain range behind us there. So nice. this is up. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, super beautiful. Really so nice. Joe, the slow pan on the first part of that video was fine. The second half made me dizzy. <laughs> yep. Right, right. A little too fast. <laughs> 360 degree views. All right, guys. That's beautiful. Well, cool. So, uh, Mike Henry, what's up? Finally got out fishing. That was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um, good kind of been in prep mode for, for my trip. Um, Got an, one yeah. more week. Henry has an epic trip coming up. One more week to go. Um, we're heading out to Wyoming and Jackson and then Livingston and Montana for about six days. Um, father-in-law, dad, brother-in-laws, one of their dads. Trip of a lifetime. Probably never going to be able to do that sort of get everyone together trip. And we'll be out there for six or seven days. So. The prep is done. Everyone flies in uh, next week. So I'll have some updates for that maybe on a future podcast. And are, are you going to be in Jackson, Wyoming, or are you going up? Where, where are you going again? We have we have two we have two places that we're staying at. We're staying south of Jackson Hole, um, yeah. closer to the Gray River and the Hoback River, but on the Snake, uh, a little bit further south than where you were at, Rob. Yep. Uh, and then we'll be there for three days. On the fourth travel day, we'll go through both parks, both national parks, and then end up in Paradise Valley uh, in Montana, nice. which is in the town of Immigrant Livingston area, and we'll be there for four days as well. Nice. So Very then, cool. Then we'll take the drive back. Very cool. I like it. Fun, you fun. Know, you know, I got my fly rods are pretty light, and my, my new airplane yeah, you get there fast. I, I can get up there in an uh, hour and a half. Swing on by. That would be swing awesome. On, swing on by. <laughs> that would be wild. All right, Mike, update. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming off of a fun weekend. So my mom and dad, 50th wedding anniversary. Nice. Wow. Super cool. Cool. And then, it well, we planned it this way because they're going to be out of town. Our son, his birthday is uh, this Saturday, but we celebrated early so my mom and dad could come over. And it was just a fun, it was just a fun weekend. We had a couple of friends, mostly family, hanging out, a little bit of Legos. Our son's going to be 10. Fun fact, your son and my wife share the same birthday. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. No kidding. We, yep. Yeah. We Olivia's birthday is this Saturday. The other day we were talking about it. Yeah. It's the, hey, Cam's birthday is on Saturday. So is Olivia's. Oh, well, there we go. I forgot. It comes around, you know, I get reminded every year. <laughs> well, Cause, Mike, cause Rob, another fun fact. Yeah, your birthday and my wife's birthday is on the same day. Yeah, which is, yeah, we have a lot of same birthdays around here, yeah. which is kind of crazy. But it was just, it was just a really fun weekend, a uh, huge accomplishment for my folks. That was cool. So we got to see them. They came down, hung out with the kiddos, and you know Carrie's parents came over, and so uh, a few friends, a few close friends came over. Cool. Together. Yeah, the math good. here, I, I'm not following the math though. They've been married 50 years. Uh, your son's 10, and you're only 22. Yeah. <laughs> So how's hard, hard to figure out. Yeah it's, yeah, it's hard to figure out. I feel twenty two. Yeah, I mean you look oh, twenty three. You look good, man. I feel twenty three. <laughs> you look good for your age. Oh, thanks and for being fifty nine. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for what you've had to go through in life, <laughs> yeah. you, look, you look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, so, just my quick update. Uh, I sent the wire. This so, is, yeah, this is cool. I bought it. Yep. We I think we've talked about it a little bit. I don't remember what we always talk about. There's a lot yeah, of time you, between. You did the chart. Um, oh, yeah, you did the chart did on one of the podcasts yeah. about the different Moonies, yep. the, the models. So I did buy a Mooney rocket. Uh, the wire is off. I'm, I don't have uh, photos that I'm going to throw up here yet. Well, that'll, yep. be, that'll be coming in one of these uh, next episodes. I'll yep. we'll, we'll show it. But it's a pretty sweet little airplane. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, now and I just got to get the uh, my other one sold. Right, and there was a, um, what was interesting watching this journey is a couple of days ago, there was a Bravo that entered the equation Yeah, that was a great yeah. looking airplane. Yeah, you know. But then it, it was flying them. Here's the thing, right? It's it's kind of funny. I, I, drive, I drive a Ram 1500 TRX, which is the most gas guzzling, <laughs> power hungry. No, like, no, no, Rob, it's a hybrid. Yeah, it, right. It's it's a large, <laughs> you know, Hellcat engine that like I have I put on my dashboard 
the, and we're going to lose a lot of subscribers right now because <laughs> all of the environmentalists are just going to be like, you're just a jerk. And here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to uh, – I put on my dashboard the gas miles per gallon. And it, and it displays in real time, live, in front of me. And what I, what I know is if, I, if my gas mileage climbs above 10 miles per gallon, I'm driving too conservative. I need to get on it a little bit and have some fun. Step on it. So that is my, that is my, my fun barometer gauge. I keep it below 11 miles per gallon, so in the 10 gallons per mile. That means I'm, I'm driving it appropriately. Like it was built. So the airplane is also a 305 horsepower turbo charged Mooney, and it's really fast. It'll climb like a homesick angel. It's really fast. <laughs> uh, it burns a little bit of fuel, uh, but I don't care. That's the now, funniest my, thing I've heard all month. My right. wife says, my wife says she needs to buy a Tesla. Just to offset to my offset. carbon emissions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> smart Which, lady. We're not even gonna go down that road because I can trace back the carbon emissions up the stream a little bit and say, "Are you really?" But we won't get into that conversation <laughs> as we continue to offend. Uh, yeah. yeah, hey, it's it, all right. I yeah. mean, some people are gonna love us, some people are gonna hate us. It's all right if you That's hate. The way me, it works. Why don't you comment below? That's the way it works. Let us know <laughs> if you love us. Why don't you comment below? Just tell but us. But when you flew the Mooney, the new Mooney, holy you, smoke! You can dial it back. You can crank up the power if you need it, or yeah. I thought this was a really cool yeah. feature. You can dial it back to a really still a fast cruise speed yeah. and be more efficient in it. Yeah, so, so it's versatile. So the, the the performance envelope of this plane was was pretty impressive. I flew it with the uh, current or former owner now, yep. uh, and um, he's on the plane for 30 years. So he wears this airplane like a glove, and he knows it inside and out. I mean, he just... Was one with the airplane. It was yeah, really that's fun. That's a to fly long with. time in one plane. Long time that's in cool. one plane. Yeah. And uh, so we we dialed back the fuel burn to 13 gallons an hour, and we were still doing 155 knots. And then we dialed up the fuel burn to about 18 gallons an hour, and we were doing over 200 knots. So he said, if you want to stretch your legs and, and fly further, longer, he goes, you can dial it back and go a little bit slower. If you want to get there faster, you can dial it up and you can get there with speed. So the performance envelope was really fun, really cool. Yep. And I'm excited for that. That'll be that'll be fun. All right, guys. Cool. So let's uh, let's let's take a turn into the world of real estate investing and talk a little bit. You know, one of the things that has come up a lot is is people just talking about talking to people. Right. So scripts are well. I, I shouldn't say scripts are the the thing because most people don't naturally and in, initially think about a script. They think about how should I talk to a seller, right? They they're and they're they're concerned with and they're not not comfortable with talking to a seller or to a buyer. And what I want to start this with is is by saying this: pros use scripts period end of story that's right tattoo it on your body pros <laughs> use scripts yep and the reason i say that and i am so compelled to just push that is because i've been doing this for a long time and i know how to have the conversation with a seller i know how to have the conversation with a buyer um and and our scripts have become just a standard part of my vocabulary. If I'm on the phone, I can I can get into script mode, but I almost always still pull up the script on my screen in front of me if I'm talking to somebody as a guide. It doesn't mean that I have to read it word for word. I used to, but I but I use it as a guide because there are elements to a script that are designed to take a conversation where you want the conversation to go. And sellers and buyers don't necessarily have the same destination in mind that you have when you get on the phone. And the destination that you have in mind with a seller should always be, I want to make an offer to buy the property which solves the problem. Remember that. 
I want to make an offer to buy the property, which solves the problem. If you remember that that is the ultimate destination that you're trying to go in your script, you're going to have the conversation in the right way if you follow a script. So if we back up for a second, a couple of things that I like to, to think about when it comes to a script is number one, knowing the destination, and then recognize that a script is a straight line. You're, you're starting somewhere and trying to go somewhere. It's a, it's a straight line that, that gets loops and curves thrown at it constantly. Right. Because the seller or the buyer, well, let's just talk seller conversation. The seller doesn't know where you're trying to go. They might be trying to go somewhere else. They're thinking, how do I, you know, they're thinking, how do I solve my problem? Is my problem even solvable? Do I recognize the extent of my problem? Like they're, they're maybe not even thinking. They're just responding to marketing. Hey, you said you're going to buy my house. How much are you going to give me? Yep. You know, that's it. And how proceed much? to come to the conversation with five walls that you have to, jump over a breakthrough or find a way around but again yeah. they they responded to the marketing with some level of interest you said there's an offer what is it exactly yeah and so the seller's coming to it you said there's an offer you said you'll buy my house how much and here's what most people do wrong they get into that conversation they jump on the phone with the seller and they immediately don't know where else to go so they start saying, tell me about the house, because that's the default way to push the conversation off of you having to speak onto the seller. Hey, so Mike, tell me about the house. Guess what, guys? Nobody cares about the house <clears throat> because every piece of real estate in America has a price that I would pay for it. So the house at the beginning of the conversation doesn't matter because how you get to that price, whether it's all cash at a discount or terms with payments over time, the thing you're trying to figure out is the problem you're trying to solve. You've got to understand why the seller wants to sell. Right. And if they're not motivated or interested in selling, the house is completely irrelevant. That's right. For, oh gosh, 20 years, the number one thing that I look for, and it, it's, it's why with, with FreedomSoft's deal negotiator, when we built that, the number one question that we asked, the first question on the deal negotiator is, are you interested in selling your house? That has been the number one question that we have asked, that I have taught people to ask for 20 years. Because take away motivation. First, we have to have someone interested in selling because, it, because motivation comes through the interest in selling and then having a problem that is big enough that they're ready to take action. And so what your job is as a real estate investor in a conversation with a seller is to, is to figure out why. Why is this person Number one, interested in selling. And then two, what pain is driving them to be motivated to sell? Interested, motivated. Step one, step two. Yep. And it comes with the why. So you guys, I know you guys have had conversations with sellers. Um, does this hold true from your experiences? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, outside of... The person that uh, is lonely and they get, you know, your mailer and say, oh, somebody to talk to. <laughs> Never had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these are the questions. Because, and so Rob, what you say is uh, so true. I sent out marketing or whatever. I found myself in conversation with a seller about a property. And here, here's what's interesting. Uh, the world doesn't care what you want. The world cares what they want. And so the default, I, th I think the reason it happens for investors is because they're subconsciously, I got to find, I want to find a property to buy. So I got to know about the roof and the foundation and the kitchen and the, all that stuff. Right. But 
that's where the mistake is made. Yep. The person you're talking to doesn't care what you want. That's right. At all. They care what they want. Yep. If you can get that through your head, and then that's what, you know, obviously our, the script that we all use that I got from you years ago, it's built to figure that out. Yep. And a great call. Uh, let me let me put it this way. You have these 911 buyers that are in the market. Right? I'll give I'll give an example. But these are these are not super common. They're out there, they're not super common. 911 buyers or 911 911 sellers, sellers sorry. 911 okay. sellers. Thank you. We uh I was working with a guy through one of our programs years ago and he chimes in and he goes, "Mike, I sent direct mail and I I got a lead already." And I was like, "Great, tell us about it." We we're on a um a group call, small group call. And he goes, uh, this lady calls me up. She got my postcard. She got it as soon as she checked the mail. She goes, I have a rental property. I need this out of my house. I need this out of my life ASAP. So here's the scenario. Recently divorced, painful event, never wanted rentals. Now ex-husband wanted rentals. She got rentals through the divorce, leaky toilet. So everything about this property was <laughs> a... Uh, really uh painful reminder of some recent life events and what was funny is i asked this guy that i was working with how fast does she want to sell and he's like well that's funny i asked her the same question she said yesterday <laughs> okay <laughs> right so there are a percentage of these yeah. where little to no skill yeah can you get this house if if they have any sense of belief that you can get this house out of their life take it now yeah right can you buy it yesterday yep um, outside of that, this is where the skill has to come in and where investors have to understand nobody that you're talking to cares what you want. Mm -hmm. If yep. you can dig into what they want and part of the, the trust piece and the rapport piece, right? Yep. That's in a good script. Yep. And if you can tap into that mm -hmm. and then offer a solution framed through, here's the deal. I may buy a house cheaper than what I'm willing to pay for it. That doesn't mean I say, ah, oh, what a great deal this is for me. Yes, I'll pay you 35 grand for this house. No, it's always framed through. So you're telling me this is the win for you, right? That's right. I think I can get that to work. Mm -hmm. But if you're not thinking that way, or even better yet, if you don't have a script that forces you or reminds you yep. to present information in this way, you're leaving who knows how many deals on the table. Well, a lot of times where people make the mistake is is, you know, in in sales, which which is you know acquisitions is sales, it's problem solving, but it's sales at the end of the day, right? So you've got you've got to make connection, you have to build rapport, you have to understand their why, why are they interested in selling, and what's motivating them to sell. Very few people talk about those two components, the interest and the motivation as two distinctively separate things. Why are you interested in selling and what is motivating you? One, one is, is, the, is the trigger, it's the interest to sell. The second is the pain, it's the motivation to make it happen. And so a lot of people miss that. So in sales, there's six components to sales, right? There's, there's uh, value. So in, in the conversation with a seller, you're, you're delivering value. You're demonstrating your expertise. You're showing empathy. You're listening. You're asking questions. You're letting them speak. You're, you're building that, that conversational rapport. So there's, so there's value. You're bringing value to the conversation. There's story because people want to hear that this is, how does this work? So there's conversational story. There's proof. Has it worked before? Uh, there's scarcity, there's urgency, and then there's the call to action or the actual offer. So there's six elements, value, story, proof, scarcity, urgency, and a call to action. And so the front side of the, the first three things, value, story, proof, that is the how I view the front half or the, the introduction first third of our script. Yeah, I want to I'm going to jut in here because this is I think where a lot of investors don't even if they have the script, they let the caller or the the seller uh dictate the speed yeah. Yeah. of that. Yep. 
And this is where you can really get thrown off, especially if there are walls built up. Maybe they have talked to other sellers or other wholesalers or other just Buyer. investors in general yeah. uh, before. So they always have a, a false sense of how this is going to go. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then, you know, if the immediate they're leading with their call to action basically is yep. you, you, you mailed me or you called me, w what are you offering? Or I need 20,000 or why are we on the phone? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the wholesaler is kind of maybe locks up and, you know, Rob taught me to focus on steps one, two, and three, but they don't want to do one, two, and three with me right now. They just yep. want to uh, hear the offer. So there, there are obviously talking points around that rebuttal, but well, that so, so you you jumped in as as we were kind of building the framework for the first third of the mm -hmm. script, right? And the but the overall design of the script is is something that I call loops and leads. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to lead the conversation to the destination that you want, and have the appropriate objection handling loops that get you back in that direction when the seller takes you off the line. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's loops and leads. And, you know, as a sidebar, that is, you know, one, one of the reasons we built the deal negotiator in FreedomSoft is we, you know, we have thousands of users and we can step back and we can look at where do people mess this thing up, right? It's it's really easy to build a list. We have, we have pre-designed, pre-built geographic lists in every city and zip code in the country. Right. So it's really easy to build a list. It's really easy to send direct mail. We've got pre-designed, proven, workable templates that you can send with a click. Yep. It's it's really easy to capture those inbound leads, right? Campaigns automatically sync up with your direct mail and you capture your inbound leads. And then everything screeches to a halt because people don't want to pick up the phone and make that call. And so we built the deal negotiator in FreedomSoft following our loops and leads script, what we call the one call close script. And we built it to deliver the experience of that script in an online interactive environment so that the seller goes through and essentially negotiates and has the conversation with themselves. And this yep. and the script online, the deal negotiator is designed to handle the loops and the leads perfectly every time. So rather than the person getting on the phone and getting sidetracked, right, the first third of the conversation where you're focused on the value, the story, and the proof, building rapport, having the conversation, and then getting into the middle part of the script where, you're, where you are exploring the the property itself and the financial condition and the and the condition of the property and you know what do they owe and how much are they getting in rent and you know what's it worth and you know all that all of the the real estate -y stuff that's the middle and then you've got the back half which is the scarcity the urgency and the offer or the call to action that back half that back third of the script people screw it up as well mm -hmm. and it and it's that back half of the script people tell us all the time you know I, I talked to an interested seller they they were motivated to sell i made them an offer and they said they were going to sign the offer and they we agreed but i never got the paperwork back people say that all the time it's because the last third of the script that back piece they didn't execute well now we'll talk about the back half of the script in the next in the next show because I know that we're going to be running up uh, on a time constraint here today, which is fine. We'll cut this a little shorter, but we'll keep our conversation on the front half of the script and, you know, what the overall concept of a script is. And then we can kind of talk about the back half of the script in the in the next episode. But if I think about what we're talking about here, you know, you've got and we, we talk about this all the time and, th and this uh, this concept, I think the concept of a, a red light, yellow light, and green light seller um, is is kind of sales 101, but it was sort of brought into my real estate investing vernacular through uh, an old COO, a chief operating officer that I had working in the real estate business with me uh, for a number of years. 
And he always talked about red light, yellow light, and green light sellers. And so that that green light seller is they're going to sell you the house because you're on the phone with them, right? They're going to sell you the house because you're sitting across the kitchen table from them. The red light seller isn't going to sell you the house even if you pay them $100,000 right. over what they're asking. <laughs> Not selling. Right? Not selling. Yeah. And the yellow light seller is where all of the money is made. Yep. That's and it's the ma- large, all. large, large majority of leads that come in. Skill, conversion, all that yeah. is where That's it comes right. into play. That's right. You've got, to, you've got to become skilled at turning a yellow light seller into an interested seller and then understanding their motivation so that you can craft the offer in mm-hmm. such a way that solves their problem. I found like uh, it, it was so critical um, as I was learning the one call close script to really set this beginning frame up. And the, the beginning frame that you're setting up is actually um, helps you deal with that back end part of the script. If you don't set it up, I had those issues where I wouldn't set up the frame and then I get to the back of the script and now I'm dead stopped at some objection because I didn't use the beginning part of the script to set up that uh, rebuttal to that objection. And so it, critical, I love the beginning talk about this, the beginning part of the script and how you have to set it up because it really is so critical when you get to the end of that to get that yellow light seller to say, oh yeah, let's do it. I, I think this is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. A good script is... It's so much more than some random words around a topic put together or around a commodity. 100%. We're buying and selling real estate. There are decades of psychological study and psychology built into a good script. That's right. Yeah. A good script has subtle little lines up front, which is why, Rob, I mean, you, you know, you've been through it thousands of times, but to still keep it in front of you. Yep. Because if you miss some of the subtleties, even in the verbiage. Yep. Right. If that's set up properly, yeah, that builds, to Joe's point, that builds the foundation for the back half of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, at the beginning, at the beginning of the script, one of the things that that we always do is, you know, the the phone call comes in, we answer the call, or that inbound call is is captured into FreedomSoft and the CRM, and you call them back. So you're either answering it live or you're calling them back and they're answering. And so the first thing you do is, um, you know, you, you call them back. They answer the phone and say, hello. You say, hey, is Mike around? That's all I say. If I'm calling them back, if I'm calling a hang up back, which two thirds of deals that get off the finish line or, or across the finish line are inbound hang ups that did not leave a voicemail. Say that again, please, Rob. Yeah, I think I, I misspoke. Two thirds are from follow up, which is calling back. Half are from hang ups. Hmm. Half of the deals that close close because you called someone back. So let me. Some uh, of those didn't even leave a voicemail, and that and would deter did, people. That, yeah, that's the hang up. Calling the back. Hang-up. Yeah. Let me translate what he just said. If you are not calling back your hangups, you're leaving half your paydays That's right. on the ground. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So you you want to go from making 50 grand a year to 100, 100 grand a year to 200, 200 grand a year to 400, start calling all your hangups back. But Rob, they didn't leave a message. They must not be interested in selling. Yeah, I think this is just must like the right. the <laughs> overarching like Mike, you've been hitting on it for like the past two much, but like the the space in between your ears, right? You you start letting yourself ask yourself questions, and you deter yourself away from calling them back. But I mean, even with the deal negotiator, right? We we all this information pops up on the dashboard about the lead, and then someone could still say, "Well, I I don't think I'm quite prepared enough, ready to call them back," or let's just say the deal negotiator isn't in the picture. And they did leave a voicemail and gave their address. I've had questions asked to me, you know, what should I come prepared with with the call? Like, should I know how much taxes are owed? Should I know if it's vacant or not? Should I know what I'm already going to offer? And they skip steps one and two and three. And the last thing they're thinking about is building rapport, building trust, finding out motivation, 
and then solving a problem. That's right. Where you know, it's hard to wrap, it was hard to wrap my head around it, but you know, I don't need to know the address. I don't need to know much. I just need to get back on the phone with them That's so right. I can talk to them. Exactly. Like a normal human being for the first three steps before I even ask a question about the refrigerator or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> when, right. when they when they first answer, when you when they either call you back or you call them, you know, the first thing you're trying to do is just tell them who you are. Mm-hmm. Tell them tell them why you're on the phone talking with them. Tell them what you're hoping to do and then ask permission to speak. So people want to know people people want to feel like you're being respectful of them and their time, even if they're gruff and abrasive and short in the first 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. If you just tell them who you are, how you got their number, you know, what what you do, um, how you do it, and then ask permission to talk to them, once they say, uh, yeah, I got a few minutes to chat, now it's really, it's really easy. And so one of the, one of the little tricks that I like to use is the area code trick. And this is just a part of what we teach um, through Mogul Academy, the area code trick uh, to all of our students that are jumping on the phone and talking to people. And it's once you get permission to speak and you jump into that conversation a little bit deeper and you tell them, you know, you're a local real estate investor and you're buying houses in the area and what you do and you, you, you know, you can't pay retail, but you're, you're willing to make them a fair offer and you get into it. Once you get that and you say, does that, does that sound like uh, something you'd be interested in having a, a conversation about Mike? And they say, well, yeah, that, that sounds, that sounds good. Then right there is where most people say, well, tell me about the house. What I'm going to tell you to do is 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 use the area code trick, and the area code trick then says, "So, hey, Mike, I I noticed um, you're buying in uh, Cincinnati, or I, you know, you own the house in Cincinnati. You you got a five one three area code. Are, are you from the Cincinnati area? Still living there? Or I notice, hey, I, I you know uh, the the house that we're talking about here is uh, up in Cincinnati. I, I notice you got a six one two uh, area code are you are you up in Minneapolis now or are you back down or are you down in Cincinnati mm-hmm. so whether they have the local matching area code or they have a distant different lo- geography area code use the area code as the sidebar to get into just a normal conversation yep. and be prepared with that like do your little research right before you jump on the phone where is this area code and yeah. where is the area code for the local spot that their house is at? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you forget, if you forget to do that, the the other little trick that I do is because there's times you, you forget to do the the research. You're like, eight oh eight. What is that? Oh, <laughs> Honolulu, right? But you you didn't look that up ahead of time. And um, if you don't, you can just say this: Hey, eight eight oh eight. I that's not a Cincinnati area code, mm-hmm. is it? Right. Right. So if just you, ask him, yeah. and, and even if you have no idea, th- then they're going to tell you where to take it. So uh, so, yeah, it's not an not a Cincinnati area. code. So wh- where is 808? Oh, it's Honolulu. Oh, are you living out in Honolulu now or h- how'd you come about the house in Cincinnati? Yeah. And uh, the one important piece right now is that y- you've probably been talking on the phone in this scenario for 60 seconds, maybe yep. at that point, you've you've broken down two walls yeah. already and then you people may have just missed that but you you yep. literally broke down two walls yep in the first scenario i i kind of go back to what mike you say people want to do business with people that they trust right so actually it's, Henry, it's the people they know like and trust. know like and trust yeah. whatever if yeah. you're gonna quote me <laughs> well <laughs> I, I i tend to think about just that a lot it, and <laughs> just get it right <laughs> i tend to think about that a lot and i think the the first section where you are just this is me i'm rob i do this this is why you got my marketing is it okay if you know we talk about that and you've allowed them to input their opinion into the conversation and say yeah i, I got i got two minutes right yep. well number one well number two is you've allowed them to express a something about themselves and now you've started to do another step in the process which is build rapport but now you know they're getting to talk 
and that's exactly. wall number two. Exactly. Which is awesome. And, and 60 seconds has, has went by in the conversation. And, and guys, I'm telling you, like, the area code trick to the, the, the breaking down of the wall in conversation, it works on the seller side. It works on the buyer side. If you master that one little thing, you're going to break down the walls of blockage, mm -hmm. and you're going to build rapport. Yep. And from there, the conversation starts to flow because you'll notice what I said, and, and some people maybe caught it, some people didn't. I said, so uh, eight, 818, Mike, that's, uh, or 80, 808, Mike, that's that's not local Cincinnati, I don't think, is it? And then he says, no, it's out in Honolulu. And I say, well, how'd you come across the house mm -hmm. in Cincinnati? And now he starts to tell me the yep. story. Born and raised, now families from right. there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then he starts to tell the story. And so now we have a conversation about the story and how long, so how long have you owned it? Well, you know, my, my mom and dad, you know, my, my dad passed away a while ago. My mom recently passed away. I inherited the house. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with it now. Um, oh man, I'm sorry to hear about your, your mom, uh, passing. And he says, uh, oh, it's, it's probably better. She was suffering, you know, for a while now and blah, blah, blah. And so we, I mean, this is just a common conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So you get into the conversation and all of a sudden there's that rapport because there's some, there's some empathy. And again, you're trying to take this conversation down a straight line, right? And the seller doesn't know that. So he might loop you over here, but you're going to lead the conversation back down the straight line, and you're taking the conversation back to ultimately the offer. You want to get to the place where you can make the offer, and you do that by understanding, is he or she interested in selling? What pain are they experiencing that is triggering motivation, and how can you solve that? You get good at that you win the game of real estate investing. Yep. What else is interesting about it downstream is when there's some rapport built and some trust, not only will the seller not have an issue with the price you agree on also being a win for you, they'll want it to be a win-win. Yeah. Because now you know each other. Yeah. You're not some random person that just showed up that they don't care about. Now you're chit-chatting a little bit. And you say, when you tell them early on in the intro, hey, uh, you know, or, or it comes up through conversation, if, it's, if this isn't a win-win, we'll just part ways as friends. Well, and this and is... It, that just starts to hit. That's what I was saying. But yeah. they now start to have somewhat of an interest in you. That's right. You've you built up you, a pipeline now for follow-up. Yeah, right. you yep. built a little rapport. Not a 100%. friendship, but you built yeah. some rapport. Yeah, and this is why having arrows in your quiver and having the, the tools in your toolbox, so to speak of I can make an all cash offer or I can make a terms offer, right? There's there's all cash, no terms. There's all terms, no cash. And then there's some cash, some terms in the middle. The the more skill you have at taking the solution down one road or another, the more successful you're going to be as a real estate investor. Mm -hmm. And because at the end of the day, one of the questions that I like to ask in the conversation is once I have some rapport built, once I understand that they're an interested seller, once I understand the why and the, and the pain that's triggering the motivation, I'll ask this question. If I'm thinking terms or, or a cash offer, I'll say, listen, Mike, let me, let me just ask you a question. If, if I was able to pay cash and close in the next 21 to 30 days, buy the property as is, we'll pay all the closing costs, so you walk away from closing with all of your money, what's the least you'd sell me the house for today? Not what's the least you would sell the house for today, what's the least you would sell me the house for today? Now that's not an all cash. The, I ask the exact same question if it's, an all, if it's a terms deal. I'll say something like this. I'll say, hey Mike, so let me ask you a question. If, if, um, if I can buy the house, at the price that we're talking about here today, and I can close in the next 21 to 30 days. I'll buy it as is. Uh, we'll take care of all the closing costs so you can walk away uh, clean from the house. You don't have to deal with it anymore. What's the least you would take on a monthly basis uh, from me to buy the house? Like, or I might say, what's the least, it, it, and it depends on if I'm thinking owner financing mm -hmm. or if I'm thinking uh, rent, you know, lease with the option, of, uh, lease with an option to purchase. 
you know, uh, rent to own. I might say, Mike, what's the least you would rent me the house for if we could get this across the finish line for you? Hmm. And so those two questions are instrumental because yep. you will land on a number that is potentially lower than what you were thinking, but it solves their problem. Right. And that's the key. Mm -hmm. So um, here's what I think we should do. I think we've been, we've been talking about this for about 45 minutes. I think we should, we should wrap. We should do a, we should do a, a session one. And I think we should do a session two. Mm -hmm. I think we should go into session two in the next show and start talking about the rest of the conversation and just keep going on this script because there's a lot more to talk about. Yep. But I think that if we if we try to talk scripts in one show forever, we'll, we'll have a three hour show. Yeah. And I, I, before we wrap, I think the, the main takeaway here is that what a lot of people get wrong is the introduction because they want to start talking about the house immediately. That's right. Because I don't know, they feel like this unwarranted pressure or speed that the conversation needs to be down yep. when, you know, some conversations I've been on is 30, 35, 45 minutes. Right. Yeah. And, and that's fine. Yeah. We, we talked, I mean, one of the first, the first deal that Rob and I did together, we talked to that lady for two and a half hours. Yeah. And we got, that. yeah, we got it on at the Saturday. price we needed it. Yep, on a Saturday after um, a few, maybe I had a conversation with her before that even. And I was inexperienced, so he had to do a little bit of finagling on the, on the back end. But um, we got it done because he was able to use that loops and leads model. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong that eventually the answers to those questions about the house is, I mean, it's used in your calculation. But before you can even start talking about that, if you haven't done steps one through three correctly, then it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's do this, guys. Let's wrap, let's wrap this episode up with a, a little quick mogul memes section, the segment that has real estate investors laughing. And then we will go into session two and continue the conversation on scripts. Let's take a look at this inexperienced wholesaler. When the seller says, I have to talk to my wife about it. <laughs> Full panic, freak out mode. Full panic, freak and out we mode. can talk about this in session two. This is a common objection, and we have a response for this. Yeah, so. 100%, yeah. 100%. And this is where it came from my experience in ha not framing the beginning yep. and not doing what we're talking about today and getting to what we're going to talk about next week. And all of a sudden, now he's got to talk to the wife. He's got to talk to the realtor. He's got to talk to the lawyer. And it's just like frustrating. <laughs> yep, exactly. So avoid this face and chime <laughs> in next week. Exactly. What uh, else we got? All right. Oh, here's here's a video one. What it feels like to make your first offer. <laughs> I am <laughs> launching, launching so off that cliff. I came across this, and I had to come up with something because that is an epic video. <laughs> So it's in reality, it's not at all like this. But talk to a lot of people. I I know this is kind of what it this feels is like. what people feel right. It's it, like yeah. And if you're just listening, this is a old vehicle that somebody launched off the side of a cliff, out of it's your comfort zone. Bam. I mean the ta the trajectory is money on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a it's like a big old what like like a 1970s old suburban Bron or yeah something. suburban or Bronco or something. Yeah. yeah and just launching off this cliff. <laughs> Oh, All right. Lord. How calling a seller feels <laughs> without a script. You're sitting in the toilet, baby. You're flushing <laughs> about yourself about out. About to flush it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I felt this before. This is, again, yeah. this is from experience. You don't want to feel this. And so you frame it with a script. Pros use scripts. Oh, Get that's it funny. in your head. 100%. All right, guys, when your investor friend tells you how an assignment agreement works. <laughs> Aha. People, Aha. Yeah. People who don't know what an assignment is and then have it explained, you can watch the light bulb hit yeah. in, yeah. in their brain. So uh, let's see. Who is, who is this guy? That's uh, Charlie Murphy, Eddie Murphy's brother. Is it? Yep. Okay, I, I didn't know. Like, I just, yeah. I just like the. That's what I was trying expression. to figure out because I'm like, that's not Eddie Murphy. No, that's Charlie Murphy. It's Charlie yeah. Murphy. Okay, another great comedian, really, really incredible talent. 
I, okay, so that's that's pretty cool. So he was hilarious. It Charlie Murphy looking at the camera, pointing at he's, his brain. He's doing the like that's he's smart. like that's yeah. a smart thing. So yeah, I had dude. this experience a couple weeks ago. We went out to uh, our family and another family from church went out to lunch, and that the topic came up. And it, what's wholesaling? And I said, well, you know, instead of exp- I said, uh, whatever. I gave him a quick answer. Yeah. On an assignable contract, you can do this. And they both, husband and wife, are friends, looked at me like, wow, didn't know that existed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Light they bulb. had this face. Yeah. Right light bulb, light bulb moments. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Mike put this in here probably because he just I learned about I it. I didn't make this one. No, I put this in here, Mike. Sweet this, is from, this is from <laughs> your training. We were doing the four flip challenge this week, oh and Mike brought this up, and I hadn't known about this oh. lady, and he showed me the clip of it, and this was just amazing. Yeah, no, ain't nobody got time for that bronchitis. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've, I've seen that video. That is It's worth right. a revisit. They, aren't they in front of a house that burned down or something? And yes. Yeah, at a, yep. an apartment complex yeah, or... Yeah. And she comes out, and I, I woke up to get me a cold pop. <laughs> and then she said, then I smelled barbecue. And she goes, and I said, oh, Jesus, there's a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so good. Oh, I love it. All it's right, so guys. Good. Well, hey, that's a wrap on uh, session one on scripts. Session We're one. dive into session two next week. That's right. Be there. I want you to subscribe if you're enjoying this on YouTube. Subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Share this with your friends and come back and enjoy the conversation next time. We'll see you. Later.